Happy Tech Talk Tuesday, you guys. I hope it's at 6 o'clock. I'm going to wait for a couple minutes for you guys to sign up. Get some more faces on here. Hey, Ron, Carl, Chris, thank you all for watching. I see you guys. We'll let a couple of you build up in here. See if we can get this thing going. Raymond, Gary, let's see here. Back to that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Sean, Pat, that's my old friend Pat. Chris Reagan, hey y'all. Uh, like that hat, yeah. This is not relative of what I'm doing. My name is Bryce, and I've been building custom engines for years, but I do them at a place called Star Racing, so don't pay any attention to that. It's just an old hat. Hey, when we when we moved from Georgia to Tennessee, we found a couple of these hats and a couple of those uh, shirts, but I didn't. I don't have any for sale. I don't have any available, and they're not really company swag at this moment. But um, I I had a I had a bad hair day, so um, I put a hat on. I could have worn my black swan hat from the 24 Hours team from Daytona, but all right. Hey Donald. <clears throat> hey Dave. Hey Chaz. How's it going there, Chaz? Um, I got some cool stuff to talk to you about today. I'm going to really try and stay on target. Last week, I kind of drifted off and got into the um, Milwaukee 8 uh, something issues, and I wanted to finish. I got a couple of notes I wrote about that. I didn't finish with you guys telling you what we really need, and there's several people selling some good oil pumps out there, and, and if I had my choice, to buy one, I would buy the Harley Davidson 2020 pump where they have done a good job on their, um, you know, do, uh, balancing their program to where they did a good job swapping over the, uh, the supply and the return. The 2020 pump, they did a good job after seven tries at Harley Davidson to balance that approach to have more scavenge and they had supply. Instead of putting together so much supply and very little return. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. Today I'm going to go into a couple other little things I want to talk about. Oh, Tech Talk Tuesday number 76. Can you imagine that? 76 weeks in a row. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, cam timing, head flow, chamber CCs, dome CCs, valve pocket CCs, and I want to tell you about the dyno numbers, flow bench numbers, theoretical compression ratio, and cranking compression ratio. And the the um, I think the abbreviation for that is dynamic compression ratio, DCR, and then CCR, I think is called cold cranking compression ratio or cr cold crank ratio. I don't know. Maybe it's CCA, cold CCR. I don't know. What do they call it when you do cold, cold cranking? I know all the battery is cold cranking amps. But anyway, I see we got some people lining up, but <clears throat> I, w I was fortunate enough on uh, this week, I saw a little interview with Warren Johnson and he helped me remember some things. Uh, and he's very outspoken and he doesn't care what you think. He darn sure don't care what I think. Uh, we don't talk, but uh, I agree with a lot of his principles and ideas. And it's, it's, it's not because of how uh, much we compare notes by no means, because I didn't ever. But when you go through the ringer, and learn and and you work hard all through the years and you make a lot of mistakes and you try to learn from your mistakes you realize some things and he said something really important to me yesterday he said they were asking about what flow bench he uses and he said i've never seen a flow bench designed correctly in my years in his 40 or 50 years he's never seen a flow bench that works correctly put that on the back shelf for a minute then the dyno that's a tool the dyno gives you some numbers it gives you results of a test. The flow bench is just numbers and they give you results of a test. A theoretical compression ratio and a cranking compression ratio. And then there's one more that I think is a really good that most people don't do and that's the static compression ratio. Static compression ratio is the hardest one to get because you have to measure the combustion chamber volume the dome and uh, dome volume minus um, valve pockets minus compression uh, deck height, head gasket thickness, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So and then you have to figure the swept volume, your bore times bore times stroke, and then you have to do the math to come up with your your bore and how far how 
how far down the piston goes and that volume is the amount that you are you have to compress and then you take that whole volume and you shove it up into a combustion chamber and if the whole volume is 10 and the chamber is one and then you shove 10 into one then that's a 10 to one compression ratio now let me break that down for you again when you see the compression ratio that is the com the engine bore times the stroke the piston at the top to the bottom gives you say it's four inch bore and four inch stroke okay that volume that volume is that volume is compressed when it goes up and whatever your combustion chamber is if you got a thousand cc's in here and then you have a hundred cc's in the chamber and zero on the dome and you shove a thousand cc's into 100 cc's that's a 10 to 1 compression ratio because it 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 shoves 10 particles into one 10 to 1 it's 10 times all right the problem with that is is that's at no speed that's not even at one rpm that is just a number that is a number Static compression ratio is a number. Cranking compression is a number. The reticle compression ratio is a number. The flow bench is a number. And the dyno is a number. All of those are how you, those are measurables, like a, a bathroom scale, a tape measure, a micrometer, or a caliper. Um, all of those, a yardstick, all of those, are a, a measuring cup, a, uh, cc's, quarts, gallons, liters, all of those are measuring sticks. For you to put together some math to compare to compare the, the systems that create something. Now, if your dyno says you make, let me tell you about a dyno. I've owned so many dynos in my life. I just sold three dynos. I sold a Superflow thousand horse dyno. I sold a two thousand horse DTS dyno, and I just sold a five hundred horsepower uh, dyno jet. They're great tools. They're like if you were on a weight loss program and you were trying to lose weight and you didn't know where you started and you didn't know where you ended up and you didn't know how much you were losing or gaining a week, you wouldn't have a way to measure it. It's just like the um, when you're cooking, you're going to have to have weights and scales and measures. you got to have uh, little spoons and teaspoons and tablespoons and ounces and fluid ounces. It's just you got to have measurement. And I know that I'm flopping around here, but I wanted to tell you that this right here, does not make the engine. This does not make the engine. This does not make the engine. This does not make the engine. And this does not make the engine. These are merely measurements. Just like the engine weighs 180 pounds. That's a measurement. Your motorcycle weighs 600 pounds. That's a measurement. You weigh 200 pounds. Those are just, these are all numbers and they're comparable to get end results. So our end result in our business and our hot rod motorcycle and hot rod engine building business for the last 40 years, our results had many looks. Some of them were trophies, some of them were checks, some of them were satisfied customers, uh, scoreboards, re results, mile an hour, ET. Uh, if you're doing a dyno contest, a dyno shootout. If you're doing a flow bench contest, you have a flow bench contest. If you're doing a weightlifting contest, you have weightlifting. Then you do uh, the Olympics. They do every kind of racing and contest, but ours was how to make power and we never really got paid for how much power we made. We never got paid for how much the head flowed. We got paid for results, the end results. We got paid for smiles per gallon. We got paid for the guy when he comes back after riding his motorcycle with his new star racing engine. And if he's smiling and going, holy blank, blank, blank. And oh my blanky, blank, blank. This thing hauls blankety, blank, blank. When you get that guy, that's when you won first place. So... All of these things gave us math to repeat and to learn from, okay? I wanted to tell you about cranking compression. Let's just start right here at cranking compression. All right, how fast does your engine turn over at cranking? 200, 300, 400? How fast is your starter motor? So if your engine is turning over 400 times or 500 times, that means that your piston is going up and down. Well, let's do the math. 500 times. How much is that? If you're idling at 900 and you turn it over at 450, that means your your piston goes up and down seven times. When you're hitting the starter button, nil, 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 piston's going up and down seven times. 
all right? That means at three and a half times, it would puff out the spark plug. Puff, 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 three and a half times a second. That's pretty fast. So what are you doing? Well, you're using the cam timing. You're using the head flow. You're using the combustion chamber volume. You're using the dome volume. And you're using the valve pocket volume plus the bore and the stroke to squeeze all that stuff together seven times a second to get a cranking compression ratio. Now, a th theoretical compression ratio figures in some static number that is not relative to anything to me. It uses cam timing. It, it figures in compression ratio static. It figures in uh, cranking compression static, and it figures in cam timing. It doesn't figure in head flow. It doesn't figure in how much air is going in the engine. It is a theoretical number that people get all excited about. They're like, how, when, where does your intake valve close on your M8 cam? Does your intake valve, where does it close? 24, 42, 52, where does your intake valve close? And they, they decide what camshaft to buy based on that number I give them, which is a ridiculous notion. And then they're like, well, what will the cranking compression be? Will it be 200? Will it be 250? Uh, my buddy down the street says it's got to be 220. I, I've never raced an engine at cranking speed. I have never raced a motorcycle engine or a car engine at cranking speed. It's like standing on a set of bathroom scales for me. What are you gonna? What, what are you gonna go down? The, are you gonna race your bike and you want how much? You want 200 horsepower? Okay. Did you know that you can go make 200 horsepower on a racing bike or a Harley, a really fast Harley, with five different cranking compression ratios. In other words, you could make 200 horsepower with 150 cranking. You can make it with 175 cranking. You can make it with 200 cranking compression. You can make it with 250 cranking compression. It's really not relative at all. The amount of power it puts out at the RPM range that you want to run the engine is what really, really matters. What it makes at cranking speed is not relative. The theoretical compression ratio, yes, this is a number. Please don't get married to those numbers. Don't, don't let this number make your decisions for you. Don't let this number make your decisions for you. Don't let the static compression rate make your, make your decisions for you. What really matters is what gasoline are you going to run, what fuel are you going to run, sorry, not gasoline, what fuel are you going to run, methanol, gasoline, high-octane gasoline, 91-octane pump gasoline. You're going to run hot gasoline. You're going to run cold gasoline. Is your engine going to be 300 or 400 degrees? Is it going to be 150 degrees? Are you going to be using it on going, stop and go traffic, 100 degree weather outside when it's 80% humidity and the engine's trying to melt the fins off of it? And then you're going to floor it when the light turns green and it starts spark knocking its nads off. Yeah, that means it's got too much compression. It's got pre-ignition. It's lighting before the spark plug does. That's not cranking compression. That's not theoretical compression. And then it's not the flow bench or the dyno doing it or the static compression ratio. It is the gasoline ability to withstand detonation. Now, in head flow, did you know that every time your piston goes down at two revolutions, your, your crankshaft turns two times in order for all four strokes to happen? Listen to me. First stroke, piston goes down on the intake stroke, goes to the bottom, and it turns around and comes back up on the compression stroke. Then it goes back down on the power stroke, and then it goes back up on the exhaust stroke, and it takes two revolutions. Here's TDC. Piston goes down on the intake stroke. Then the piston, the crankshaft, turns around back to TDC on the compression stroke. Then the crankshaft turns around again to the bottom on the power stroke, and then the crankshaft turns around again on the exhaust stroke, it takes two revolutions for it to make one, two, three, four. It takes the, the intake, intake, compression, power, exhaust. So when your engine is running 6,000 RPM, the piston is going up and down 100 times a second. That's easy math. I took 6,000 RPM divided by 60 seconds equals 100. Now, the intake valve opens only 50 times a second. Now, how fast can you move your hand at 6,000 RPM? Can you do, nope, you can't do, you can't do but about 10 times a second. So that means at idle, your piston goes up and down 15 times and the intake valve opens seven and a half times. 
So at cranking speed, you can't even do cranking speed at 900. Let's say your idle is 900 RPM or say your idle is 1,000 RPM. You can't do cranking speed at, uh, at 900 or 1,000. If you did, you would only compress it 15 times a second. But in reality, the intake valve only opens seven and a half times a second at idle. A pro stock Suzuki, for instance, that turns 13,800 RPM, the piston goes up and down 230 times in one second. Like Humminbird can't even hardly move that fast. And the intake valve opens and closes 115 times a second. What does the world does that all have to do with it? And your gasoline is your limit. The RPM range you're going to run and all these pieces of the system have to balance and they have to match. It's going to make a big difference, not any of these numbers. And, you know, the, the dyno is cool. This is my favorite. The dyno gives me the closest thing to reality because if it makes 150 horse on the dyno, I'm pretty sure the guy's going to be impressed. And if it makes 150 and he's going to stop by the Chevron and get 91 octane, I'm pretty sure he'll be able to drive it to work and back and home and back without overheating or spark knocking or pre-igniting. So the dyno is very important, in my opinion. The flow bench is one of the least important things because the flow bench is so wrong. The flow bench is so wrong. The flow bench... If you've ever used a flow bench or you ever watched a guy, do you know anybody with a flow bench? Do you own a flow bench? If you own a flow bench, you're mad at me because you paid money, you saved up, you made payments on it. I've owned all the flow benches. I've had flow benches. I had a 110, a 600, a 750, 800. I had a SF. I got 1020. Um, even had a Larry Widmer built with a three-phase 10-horse engine, a motor with a Paxton supercharger on it, and it would pull 50 inches. And when you turned it on, the birds would take off because it had an eight inch intake pipe up that went outside. And when you turned it on, all the air in the neighborhood went down that pipe. So, what was wrong with it was it showed the air going one way constantly, constantly. Now, think about your Harley at 6,000 RPM, your piston is going down, up and down 100 times a second. 100 times a second. Now, that means the intake valve only opened 50 times a second and the exhaust valve opened 50 times a second. It did 50, 50 uh, compression strokes at 6,000 RPM per second. Now, on the flow bench, you'll set that baby at, say, 600 lift, and you'll turn the the depression up to 25 inches, 28 inches, or whatever you can get it up to, and it's going, whoo, whoo, it's just blowing air in there. It's blowing air in there. And the valve is not moving, and there is no piston in the hole. There is only an open hole, whatever your bore size is, deep as it'll go, like all of your arm will disappear all the way down into the flow bench. So the stroke is three foot deep, and the piston four is this big and you got a valve going out 600 lift and it's sitting there it's just sitting there and you turn the flow bench up to a steady pressure depression of 28 inches and the vacuum cleaner or the lots of vacuum cleaners inside the flow bench are screaming and it's pulling outside air through the port one direction right by the intake valve into that three foot deep hole with a four inch bore and the air is just going in there. And you're steady trying to tune it to get just the right number so you can see my head flows 362 CFM at 600 lift at 28 inches. And then you shut the machine off and then you take a picture of the flow chart, you put it on the internet, and then it's bragging rights. But guess what's going on inside the engine? If you take that head right then, and you're talking about how noisy it is, that head, it doesn't like this kind of lift, and it doesn't like this because it's noisy, and it backs up, and it's going, it's making, it's, it, people, what do they say? It's turbulent. It's turbulent over the short term. Well, guess what? At 6,000 RPM, piston's going up and down 50 times a second. How do you know what's turbulent? How do you know what's going on over the short term? It's like my buddy Joe said one time, did you put on a space suit and crawl down in there and miniaturize yourself from six foot tall, 200 pounds, down to this little itty bitty little ant man and you put on your little space suit and you go in there and you put some epoxy in the port and hook your chain to it and you stand there 
and wet your finger and stick it out there in the wind and see what's going on in there. This is what's going on in there. This is what air looks like going in and out of the engine at 6,000 RPM, right here. It's going in and out, in and out, in and out a hundred times a second. There ain't no flow bench show going on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you own one and you get mad at me, I'm all right. It's okay. You don't buy nothing from me anyway. I'm just telling you what I know. And when I say that, please understand. That's me saying what I think I know. These are my opinions, not everybody's. How many flow benches have I bought? Probably more than you. How many flow benches have I owned all the way through 2020? Probably more than you. Some of you guys got a flow bench and you love it. Let me tell you something. A flow bench is just as valuable. The dyno is 20 to 1 more valuable than the flow bench, in my opinion, because the flow bench tells you a little teeny, weeny, teeny, weeny, teeny, weeny snapshot of what's happening. That's what's happened that much right there out of this much of an engine. And tell me, tell me, and I want to tell you about the head flow. When you're doing cranking compression and you hit the starter button, nah, 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 and your head doesn't flow much, not much air goes in to get compressed. Even if it's seven times, 15 times, not much air goes in if your heads don't flow much. If your heads flow a lot, you can take, you when you check cranking compression, a lot of air goes in because you have a high, a big valve, you have big ports, and when your piston's going up and down, it creates a depression when the piston goes down, even at idle, goes down 15 times. It goes down and back up, down and back up, down and back up. It is pumping a lot of air, y'all. And if the head has big valves and it's a high flow head, and I'm not talking about flow bench numbers, I'm talking about just area and the size of the valve, it will have more cranking compression. But this theoretical compression ratio right here, they don't ask you how much the head flows. They don't, they, <laughs> that's not even part of it, unless I'm wrong, unless I don't know what I'm talking about. But the dome volume, if you got 20 cc's in, the, in a 100 cc chamber, you're gonna have more cranking compression, even with a stock cam. If you're going to have zero dome volume, zero dome volume, like a flat top, not a 20 cc or not a 12 to 1 or 14 to 1 piston, you just got a zero dome and you have a stock camshaft, you're going to have less cranking compression. So you can get cranking compression with dome cc's, smaller chamber cc's, more head flow, or early intake valve closing. Not one or the other, but you can put a 15 to one to get 15 to one uh, compression ratio, static compression ratio, 15 to one, and you can put a really big camshaft like a 300 degree camshaft where it closes the intake valve at 60 or 70 degrees after bottom, and you won't have but 200 pounds cranking compression and your theoretical compression ratio, who knows what that would be. But at 6,000 or 8,000 or 13,000 RPM, the compression ratio, the dynamic compression ratio, not theoretical, but what's really going on in there will show up on the scoreboard. It'll show up on the dyno. It'll show up on the seat of the pants, and the customer will be really, really happy. So make sure that you don't get confused by this. Deep, those guys out there have these big pop-up pistons, but they have these really deep valve pockets. They've got valve pockets a half inch deep, 200 deep, quarter inch deep, whatever, so that any valve will go in there, any camshaft timing will go in there, so they put these giant pockets so that they don't have to cut them. They just make them really big. Well, if they have a pop-up piston, it probably nets out about zero because if you have a dome that's 15 cc's tall on a Milwaukee 8 and you have valve pockets, that are 15 cc's deep, that's a net zero piston. It will run the same as a flat top with no valve pockets. Chambers, if you got a 90 cc chamber or a 80 cc chamber, it changes this compression ratio a ton and how much your head flows. Big flow heads, not flow bench, but just big valves, big ports, they, they make more power because they trap more air in the engine. All of this is trapping air in the engine. You can do it with all of these things.
Now, I skipped over the high spots and kind of goofed all this up by talking about it, but I wanted you to think about a few things that happen here. This static compression ratio, one more time. Let's say you got 15 to 1. No, let's use a real good one that guys buy. They buy 11 and a half to 1 static compression ratio. Now, when you buy a set of pistons and you ask all the time, what compression ratio are the pistons? Well, they aren't. You have to know you have to know the combustion chamber cc's, you have to know the piston head clearance, you have to know the valve pocket volume, you have to know the head gasket volume, and you have to also know is the piston down in the hole 40, out of the hole 10, down in the hole 60. All of those numbers affect the static compression ratio, so there is not a good answer with a piston. A piston is just part of a formula that has to be put together to make all of this work. The head flow. cam timing, the chamber volume, the dome volume, and the valve pocket volume matter. And when you do a static compression ratio, one more time, it doesn't, that's sitting at no speed, that's sitting dead still, that's what static means, there's nothing's moving. You got a piston sitting in a hole, you got a valves in the chamber and a head gasket, and you drip it full of fluid and you see what the cc's are versus the total volume of the engine or the cylinder and it gives you a static compression ratio now when it's running the piston's going to come further out of the hole the clearances in the rods and the clearances in the mains are going to extend on overlap and your piston's going to go higher up centrifugal force thermal dynamics uh, the piston's going to grow in length, the rod's going to grow a little bit in length, the crankshaft's going to try and come out, the wrist pin's going to try and come out. All of these things close up the clearances to where you have a higher compression ratio than static. Just know that these are just numbers. Uh, and the last little thing I want to tell you, and I'm going to switch this screen back over because I know I jacked the, that all around, but let me turn this back around and talk to you person to person. I want to say this. If you ever heard of like um, body mass index, I think they call it BMI. I might be talking way out of school, but I know that when I went in and, and learned about uh, my visceral fat and all the different parts of my body where I was overweight, I was 220, 225 pounds for six foot tall. And my BMI or my body mass index was some crazy number. And I just wanted you to know that there are people that are really skinny that are 220 and six foot tall, and they have tons of muscles on them, tons of muscles. So you can have a 200 pound person that can be obese, and you can have a 200 pound person that's not obese. It's just like these compression ratio numbers. The uh, theoretical compression ratio is just a number. But you don't, like if, if you go to the doctor and he says, According to this chart, you weigh too much for how tall you are. You weigh too much for how tall you are. I went back and looked at what my perfect body mass index, the BMI, what it was. I got to be like 50 pounds less. I'm like, really? I don't see 50 pounds coming off of me. I really don't. Last thing before we hang up. Everybody asked me about my socks. Today, I got on my penguin. They're penguin socks. <laughs> uh, thank you all for watching. My time has ran out. Um, please let me know if you'd like to know more about what I was talking about, and maybe I'll do a better job breaking it down for you. I just try to make it uh, a little bit easier to understand. I'm sorry if I made you mad if you bought a lot of stuff based on some of these numbers. But the numbers are not the gospel. They're just pieces of the recipe to make the cake. Pieces of the recipe. You can't have just the egg doesn't make the cake or just the milk or whatever you use. I've never made a cake in my life. I heard about it. But anyway, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Steve, Chris. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate you guys following me. Number 76 is in the books. I look forward to seeing you again before uh, next Tuesday or right on next Tuesday. Um, we have to look out for each other, you guys. We have similar passion. We love hot rods. We love motorcycles. We love engines. We love making horsepower. We love learning. 
we need to learn, we need to share what we've learned, and we need to take care of each other, you guys, because without each other, there ain't none of us. May God bless. I love y'all. Please stay uh, tuned in for the future. Tech Talk 76 out.